this morning. Good morning, everybody, and we'll get open up God's Word and see if we can find His truths and bring them to where we can actually understand them. His truths aren't that hard to understand. The problem is we cloud it with our interpretation. Because we don't, the truth, you ever heard them talking about the truth? You can't handle the truth. Well, most of the time we don't want to handle the truth because the truth not only will set you free, it'll tie you up and set you straight. Amen. You know, the truth will set you straight. So let's um, look at Proverbs 27, starting at verse 4. Beautiful thing about Proverbs is every, every line you get a totally different thought sometimes. So you can, you can be... Um, Almost, almost bipolar, jumping back and forth between all the different thoughts on it. When you look at uh, Proverbs 27, verse 4, it says, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? And I was, you know, reading through that and I thought, you know, I could probably get all over that and dissect it and preach for about a month right there, but there's so much more to do. And that wrath, that is... The rage, that's what wrath is. And if you thought about how if we allow ourselves to rage, we allow ourselves to get really super souped up angry, it's cruel not only to us, but the people around us, the people who have to witness us. We're mean to them, and it hurts us. It actually burdens our soul whenever we allow ourselves to, to rage. So if you think about it, we, we need to, Work towards giving that to God rather than letting that anger build in us. Okay? And what does it say? And anger is outrageous. And whenever I was studying on that a little bit, lose my little little spot here and get all. It, it says a torrent is what it says. Outrageous are a torrent. It's it's Anger is a, is a vicious circle. It's a vicious cycle. Once you get caught into it, you can't get out of it, and you're not making any sense. You're going to do things and say things and hurt people that you, you shouldn't. Actions speak louder than words. Absolutely. And whenever you get, whenever you get, find yourself, because I, I should be a poster child for it. I used to have a, a temper and still do sometimes that I'd have to deal with that would make a rattlesnake look sweet. Okay? Only way for me to get rid of that, only way for me to deal with that, is whenever I feel it boiling up, I have to praise God. I have to think of Jesus Christ, the crucified, for me. Otherwise, that cruel anger, hatred, rage is going to consume me, and I'm going to do and say and act in stupid ways. That's going to, it's going to bring me down. It's going to bring the people around me down. It's going to mess with my witness. It's just going to be a problem. Am I? Do I always succeed? No. Do I strive to do better? Do I try to learn from it? Do I read things like this and think, God help me. I cannot do it on my own. That cruel wrath and rage will get me. Who is able to stand before envy? Now, what is the envy? That's the thing that we have, or jealousy. That's the thing that this world is full of. That is what some of the political platforms is made on, is jealousy and envy. If I can get class envy, if I can get you mad at him, then I can do whatever I want to and get away with it, okay? If I can get you focused on somebody else's, what they got and you hadn't got, the little bit of difference is how unfair is it that they get paid a nickel an hour more than you do? then you're busy worried about that and you ain't messing with me and I can do whatever I want to. Have you ever thought about how we let jealousy or worry about what somebody else is doing consume us and then we get to the rage part? It's all stepping stones that we have to watch for that will keep us from worshiping a true and living God. What do you think all of this is designed for? To keep your focus on Rage, jealousy, and problems rather than praise God. Worship the King. How can we live a joyous life? Do we have to take and buy the book and do the 10-step plan that 
some fancy preacher guy that claims to be a preacher preaching heresies and prosperity gospel is going to give you. And if you'll buy his book, you can have. I tell you what, all you got to buy is this book right here. Jesus, the, the, the book of the Holy Bible. And it's going to give you what you need in order to get where you need to be. If you'll study it and you'll seek him. And every time that you feel yourself being drawn away and pulled into the garbage can of hate and anger, praise the Lord a little bit. Ask him to give you the calmness that you need. Because I, I, like I said, you know, rattlesnake's a sweetheart compared to my temper. And so I have to, I, I, I seriously know what it's like. Here's another thing that's going on in the world. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Open rebuke. Do you love somebody enough to tell them that they're wrong? Do you love somebody enough to say, you know, do you let them walk around all day, and this is going to sound gross, but you let them walk around all day with a booger hanging out of their nose, or do you say, hey, whew, you got something going on there. You might check up. That's a nice way to say it. You don't just point and laugh and holler, but you go, hey, check up. You got something going on there. And I was thinking about this secret look better than secret love. I'm thinking about all of the people who sit and say nothing to people. Whenever their heart's burdened for them because they feel they're going to hell. They haven't. They know that they're not saved. They know that they don't know Christ. They know they're headed the wrong way. And rather than saying, hey, you need Jesus, or trying to do it nicely, they just don't say anything. It's like, I love that person and godly love, and I wish I could do something to help them. Well, what are you wishing for? Why don't you say something? Why don't you speak up and say, Jesus loves you? Amen. You know? Don't be secret. Or, you know, are you in the, the CIA, the secret, the secret service for Jesus? There ain't no such thing. Be the CIA, the Christ in action. That's what we need to be. Stepping up, trying to step out and speak to people about Jesus. Look at this. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Have you ever noticed you got to watch some people because you can't do no wrong around them? They patting you on your back and telling you ever. You better watch and check and see how many knives they got in their hand if all they ever do is pat you on the back. If they don't ever say, hey, you know, we love you, but you kind of goofed up a little bit right here. And and we only want to tell you because we love you. We don't want you to walking around doing that. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. If a friend is wounding you for your good, they're not doing it out of spite or hate. They're trying to help you get where you need to be. <laughs> the full soul. Now, this is something that whenever I was reading it last night, verse 7, the full soul loatheth or hateth and honeycomb, but the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. And whenever I was thinking about that, it's kind of like, you know, whenever, why do we have trials and tribulations? Why do things go wrong for us? Whenever we're fat and full, we're not worried about anything. We throw things away. We're wasteful. We're even wasteful of people. Whenever we got plenty of friends and plenty of things, we're not tender-hearted and loving like we should be. We're not really empathetic and worried about anybody else. We'll stomp all over somebody or throw them away if we're fat and full. And it's the same if we got plenty of money and plenty of whatever else. If you fill in the blank of whatever we got plenty of, we don't value it as much. How do we stay humble? If we understand from the very beginning we don't own any of it, it is all an allowance that God has given us. Okay? He has given it to us as stewards. And if we're good stewards, of anything rather than stomping on it, wasting it. How many gifts has God given us that we wasted? That we didn't, you know, we didn't take the opportunity. He gave us a day, a full day, woke us up alive, and we didn't tell anybody about Jesus. 
We didn't share his love with anybody. But we got our family that loves us. We got our church family that loves us. But we're not worried about trying to love nobody else. But those who are downtrodden, who've been run over a few times, have the more loving hearts usually because they're still there. They remember the pain of being run over. And they want to reach out and help more than those of us that, you know, haven't had anything bad happen lately. It just boggles the mind sometimes how how we get we forget so easy what God's commanded us to do. Let's look at first John chapter three for a second. And a lot more written down here, but I don't think we're gonna get to all of it. First John chapter four. First John chapter three, verse eleven. Three. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Love one another. You know, the world tells us, forget everybody. Do your own thing. Be about your own business. Uh, you know, do it all for yourself. Love one another. Look at verse 12. Not as Cain, who without was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him. That's the question. Wherefore, why did he slay him? Because of his own, because his own works were evil. So why do we have people that are hating? Because their own works are evil. Okay? And his brothers were righteous. So if somebody's hating you for doing the right thing, think about how long that's been going on and don't fret it much. If you didn't get killed over it. Think about the religion of hate that's going around killing people that are trying to live righteous and hate them. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We knew that we have passed, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Simply said, marvel not that the world hates you. If you're really trying to live right and do right, marvel not that things are trying to drag you back to make you angry, to make you rage to make you hate, to throw you off, to make a complete fool out of you because that's what the world does. That's what evil does. And whenever anything is doing evil or being evil, it's jealous of you if you're trying to do right. It's jealous of you if you're making it in Christ, if you're living it through Christ, the world is jealous and hating you because their misery is full and your joy is complete. And they're going to hate you for it. All you can do to do it right is to love them and to continue to try to do the right thing regardless of them. You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because of who it is or what it is. You do the right thing because that honors Jesus Christ who died for you, who lives for you. I seen one the other day that kind of, a guy was going to give me a crucifix thing. He was showing it to me and he was proud of it. And I said, that's great, but I don't want it. I said, my Jesus is not on that cross. He is risen. He's not dead. He's not dying. Okay. He's alive and well, sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, okay? Making intercession for me because I can't do it. He is the one that's doing it. Mary can't do it. None of the saints can do it, okay? Your mama can't do it. She can pray for you. She can't make intercession directly to the Father, only Jesus. Look at verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. What? You just told you hate him, you're a murderer? Yeah, that's what Jesus had said, isn't it? And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. We can't hate with that complete hate that just goes on and rage and rage and rage and rage. We have to give it to God and get rid of it. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, remember what I was talking a while ago? 
about time. Lay down your life for the brethren. I was looking at that. You didn't necessarily got to die to lay down your life for the brethren. What do I mean by that? We can take a little bit of time and visit somebody. We can take a little bit of time to talk to somebody. The biggest trap, one of the biggest traps I've gotten into is I'm in such a hurry. I ain't got no time to talk to nobody. I got to go. I got things to do. I got things to get done. I've got I've got stuff to do. I can't sit here and just jaw jack and just enjoy your company and love you and with a perfect godly love and uplift you. How much time have I wasted and how many wonderful people have I stepped on because I didn't have time? I thought about it a couple of times. My own grandpa was just wearing himself out trying to spend time with me back when I was in my 20s and I was too stupid to know it. I wasted days and days that I could have spent with that man. Had an uncle that was the same way. He wanted to spend time with me. And I don't know how many times I hurt those two wonderful men's feelings because I was an idiot in a hurry. Wouldn't slow down, trying to make it. What am I trying to make? Where are you going to get to? It's all useless if you don't have if you don't have God's love. If you if you waste it all, if you don't share God's love, you're wasting your time busting it, trying to get somewhere. Do need to work hard. We do need to work hard. But why don't we lay down some of our life and spend it with people who truly love us? Spend it trying to share God's love. Same thing with my little nephews. I looked around, they was grown. And they, they was nothing like them wanting to hang out with Uncle Johnny a little bit and us playing. They was seven, eight, ten years old. Next thing they're grown and got kids. What? Waste your time. Waste your life. Lay it down a little bit. Give it to God. And love the people he gives you to love. Share that wonderful godliness. Don't blow it, you know. They're so, it's so easy. It's so easy to miss it. I was thinking about Galatians. Let's go to Romans for a second. We might wrap it up in Romans. We might just skip Galatians today. Romans chapter 6. As we were talking about a while ago, different things on there. Romans chapter 6, we was talking about sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because, you know, some say, well, you're saved. You can go and do whatever you want to. Not without consequence, you can't. God's going to deal with you if you want to his. If you're without chastised, but you're bastards and not sons. Okay? What's it say right there? God forbid. How shall we then, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not? that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like Christ, as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, are, we also should walk in newness of life. We should be striving to be better. We're claiming to be his. We put our faith, trust, and hope in him. For if we have been if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this that our old man is crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now that does not mean that we will not sin. We should not serve sin. We're not a slave to sin. It doesn't own us. It's not who we are, it's not where we stay. It's not where we live. For he that is dead is freed from sin. For if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over us. So sin is not dominant. It's going to be ever present in this flesh, but it's not going to dominate. It's not going to be all that we are. Okay? For in 
that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So we need to live unto God. We need to live godly, work towards being that godly person. Look at uh, Galatians 5, starting at verse 13. I don't think I can leave this out. Galatians 5, starting at verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Kind of the same stuff I was going over, you know. Says it over and over and over. You know, if, if something is really truth, a true little nugget of truth you're going to get in the Bible that God really wants us to know, it's in there three, four, five, six times usually. It's not in an obscure half of a verse that you have to put with another half and you have to add together and, and divide by three in order to get. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Take time. We got to take the time. And I don't know, I guess it was a it was a, a total defect in, in me. Couldn't do it. Didn't know how. Never learned it. But if ye bite and devour one another, how about that backbiting? You know of that going on anywhere? How many churches are almost destroyed for backbiting and underhanded and families backbiting and underhanded businesses? Take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. How you consume one another? Galatians 5, starting in now we're at 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do you walk in the spirit? You have to work at it. Day by day, hour by hour, you have to connect with, the, with God and ask him to touch you, to heal you, to, to move you away from it, to calm you, praise him a little bit. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So, I failed. I failed miserably. Yeah? You said you would. Sometimes you're going to fail, but we've got to keep trying to do better. The flesh and the spirit are arguing, and you're living in the flesh, whether you like it or not. We have to fight with it. But if you be led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, her heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So what does that mean? They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who put their faith in those things. Those who put their trust in those things. Those who are living that life continually. They have not put their faith, trust, and hope in Christ. Okay? They're putting their faith in all of these things, in all of these witches and all of these things. Humanism. Worshiping politicians. There's just so many things that people worship other than a true and a living God. They're putting their faith in other than Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen. But the fruit of the Spirit is, now let's study these so we'll know. Let's hunt these down. Because those others, we know, you know in your heart what's bad. We ain't got to study that. What's good? The fruit of the Spirit is love. We went over that. Not sex, it's love. There's a difference. Joy. What is a joy? Peace. Long suffering. Gentleness. That's stuff you got to work at. Goodness. Faith. Here's the one that always eats me alive meekness. Meekness isn't weak, it is slow to anger. Oh boy, 
how do I slow down here? I have to I have to put a long fuse on there. I have to douse water on it. I have to I have to pray over it. I have to praise God. I have to do things in order to be slow to anger. Temperance. And that temperance, that's and that self control. Let me double check on that. Check my notes. That's my self control in it. And uh Yeah, self control. Against such there is no law. How about that? There's no law against doing the right thing. Well, that goes flies in the face of that uh, idea that no good deed goes unpunished, doesn't it? Well, you know why no good deed goes unpunished? Because we were looking at the reason Cain slew Abel. The reason a good deed gets punished is because somebody who's unrighteous is raging against the righteous because their deeds are ugly and yours are good. And they know that God's going to favor you over them because you're doing right and they're doing wrong. Okay? That's the only reason that a good deed goes punished. Because somebody with evil in their heart does not want to see good prevailing and they're going to try to squash it. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions, uh, the affections, and lust. It's a fight day by day. Day by day to do the right thing. Because evil is ever present, waiting, waiting, and waiting. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You know, I found that if I make sure that every time I get up in the morning, I sit up and I say, Thank you, Lord, for this day. And please protect me and guide me through it. Start off with that. Rather than, oh, grouch, 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 grouch. You know, there's been times that, you know, way back in the day, you reach over and start the day with a cigarette and hunt for coffee. None of that is going to get you in the spirit of good. Okay? Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. How many folks these days want the vain glory? I want everybody to honor and praise me about what a great message I've done, what a great man I am, how good I am. No, I don't want none of that. I hope that something that I say touches your heart and makes you cl- gives you a clue of how to get closer to God. We're not to envy one another. Brother Al got a, got a fine diesel truck. I like it. I like. I love Brother Al. I'm glad for him. I'm not like, oh, man, why don't I got no diesel truck? You know? Because it ain't time for me to have one. If it gets time for me to have one, God will make sure that I get one. Not envying one another. Be proud for it. Be thankful that God blessed him. We think about it. We shouldn't be envious of anything anybody's got that had not got Jesus. And if they got Jesus, they're our brother. We should be proud and praising God that they've reached the point that God will trust them with some extra of whom much is given, much is required. Yeah. And every time we get something, we need to remember that. If we don't love our brethren and uplift each other, and we don't point everybody to Christ the crucified and risen. He is there for salvation. He is the only way to salvation. Then we've shared love, true love.